Let me tell you that it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker this morning, Paul Ebert. He is a professor in Canada research chair in molecular biodiversity at the University of Guelph, which is near Toronto. He has a um, bachelor degree in biology from Queen's University, a PhD in genetics from Cambridge University, and a postdoctoral fellow from, fellowship from the University of Sydney. After taking up a faculty position at, at Windsor, he directed its Great Lakes Institute and led the Huntsman Marine Science Centre. He directed the Biodiversity Institute of Ontario at Guelph for a decade until it transitioned into the Centre for Biodiversity Genomics in 2015. Its research facilities, staff, and informatics platforms are supporting major initiatives in biodiversity science. Most importantly, that institute has enabled the 300 million research programs, barcode 500K Bioscan, undertaken by the International Barcode of Life Consortium. Uh, Paul has advised more than 100 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, while his 550 publications have received more than 100,000 citations. He is an officer in the Order of Canada, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and has honorary degrees from four universities. He has also received several international awards, including the 2018 Heineken Prize for the Environment and the 2020 Midori Prize for Biodiversity. And let me tell you that um, if you are doing any work related to DNA to identify species, or you are using eDNA, as it is very trendy, it all started 20 years ago with an evolutionary ecologist in Canada who was doing groceries and was wondering if we can have a similar system to identify species. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Eber. Andy, Adriana, thank you so much for the chance to join this meeting. Um, have you ever been to a party Friday night? Didn't know many of the people there. It's a little chilly when you first get there. And uh, then you start talking with people. And as the evening progresses, you begin to feel, how could I have ever lived without knowing these folks? And so geo this is my first opportunity to join a Geobond meeting. And I have to say, I'm just so impressed with the scale of work that's ongoing and the different perspectives that are being brought to it. I live in a little box. Uh, a little DNA box, and I'm going to uh, I th I'll try and convince you that the insights that uh, we're gaining through the analysis of DNA can contribute in a very powerful way to understanding and protecting life um, on our planet. And uh, as Adrianda indicated, um, I'm representing the International Barcode of Life Consortium here this morning, and uh, the title of my talk is a mission for Planetary biodiversity, as you observe, um, if I had the chance to retitle it right now, uh, it would be titled A Shared Mission for Planetary Biodiversity because I absolutely know that DNA can't go it alone. The motivation, uh, you know, these uh, are such familiarly shown images, but I just always retain them. You've seen them. Um, the dramatic declines in life in our planet during our lifetime, certainly during my lifetime, uh, is, is just staggering concern for us as a community, and it should be for humanity at large. And yet, as I look at the power that we bring to bear on biosurveillance, and I think about the studies that have revealed these declines, uh, they're largely artisanal. You know, these are not industrial, highly structured programs. The decline of uh, bird population, 30% decline in North America, was due to, led by university researchers. World Wildlife Fund and its Living Planet report this uh, massive decline of about 3,000 species of vertebrates, and an amateur natural history society reporting a decline in insect uh, populations which had been overlooked by mainstream scientific community. Um, 
we need to get serious. We need to get serious about thinking, and I mean, you know, I know that's the mission of Geobon, so I'm not saying anything new to this community, but let's take a, a planet, let's take our planet with its 15 million uh, square kilometers of surface area, and then let's just grid it. Let's throw 3,000 blocks on it, 170,000 square kilometers, each and two-thirds of them, of course, are in the water, and the other third are on land. And let's think about what it would mean if um, we had a planetary biomonitoring system that was tracking the presence of every species in every one of those blocks on a recurrent basis. That's sort of the cube concept that Andy and others have introduced earlier. Um, to me, this is a mission which is very achievable. If we think about rolling it out on a national scale, 3,000 sampling points sort of sounds um, interesting until you drop them on Germany, which would manage to cover about two of those, you know, two, if we're just sampling each of those blocks. Um, we need finer resolution, of course, so let's drop 100 squares in each of those blocks. And then I think you get to something that's reasonable. It can't be a few hundred sampling points in a country like Germany repeated across the surface of the Earth and across the planetary oceans would give us a very deep understanding of what's happening to the trajectories of life. So imagine knowing them, and not just knowing them, but tracking them, the dynamics. So let's look back to 1995. Let's suppose this system had been in play, and um, the Emerald Ash Borer at that point in time was uh, restricted to its home territory in green, and if you took one of the blocks and looked at the grid squares in it, of course, some of them would be illuminated with uh, the presence of emerald ash borers, and others ones wouldn't. But that's where it was in 1995. Of course, we did not have a monitoring system in place, but we do know that by 2005, colonization events had occurred in Central Europe and in North America, and um, the point of uh, interception was about Detroit, probably. That's the red square in North America, and since then, uh, of course, the emerald ash borer has spread widely and has caused unbelievable havoc to our ash forests and the species associated with them. And now let's not think about just this one species, but let us think about the Argentine ant. Let us think about 10 to the seventh species and mapping the distribution will changes of all of those species on the planet. Is that possible? Well, here's a serious roadblock. We've been at this game for 265 years of scientifically registering species. Um, we charitably, those of us who would um, like to keep the number low, uh, it might be about 20 million species is the best estimate today of multicellular species, just multicellular alone. Actually, I think a more probable number could be closer to 50 million. So there's a massive number of species, multicellular species, not unicells, multicellular, undescribed. What would it cost to describe them using morphological approaches? A phenomenal amount of money, a trillion dollars, uh, based on past uh, costs to describe species. And it's going to be too slow. We have to look for ways to expedite the registration of species and to understand their distributions. And I, I really love this uh, message that was sent by George Hale to the Rockefeller Foundation 95 years ago, to the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. He had a grand idea. He wanted to build a really large telescope and he wanted to build it on Mount Palomar. And as an effort to convince the foundation, he pointed out that no method of advancing science is so productive as the development of new and more powerful instruments and methods of research. And over the last three days, all I've heard is about the new powerful instruments that we have and new approaches to analyzing the data. Biodiversity science is poised for one of these revolutions, revolutionary moments in a discipline when everything is going to change in decadal scales. So what kinds of technologies can we bring to bear on understanding life on the planet? Well, it's very clear that remote sensing will have an important role to play. Bioacoustics and imaging will have an important role to play. And of course, I'm going to be the DNA advocate, so you're going to get more DNA than you might think fair, but I feel I've got a reasonable grounding now in remote sensing, and I uh, heard some great talks on bioacoustics as well. So please allow me to focus on DNA that I do know a little bit about. Um, 
Remote sensing, what a powerful tool to gain a synoptic perspective on life on our planet, to understand algal blooms in the oceans, forest loss, shifts in bud burst phenology. It's a magnificent tool and things I've heard at this meeting lead me to believe it's be going to become obviously much more powerful through time. Bioacoustics, what a fantastic approach to survey the large or the noisy species on our planet, both above the ground and in the waters. So um, I see this as just a really, really important contribution to the global biomonitoring program. And where does DNA come in? Well, the silent majority, the small majority, the tiny life that makes our world go round. And so that's what a lot of my talk is going to be focused on, that com those compartments of life. So let me just, before leaving that, just try a quick summary. You know, here are the six essential biodiversity classes. Genetic composition. I don't think it's going to be sensed. It's not going to be analyzed with remote sensors. Ground-based sensors are going to have difficulty. DNA, that's what its job is. Species populations. Every one of these approaches is generally contributing some information and they're complementary. Um, but as you can see, I put a lot of plus signs there. I have a, I'd love to have a remote sensor uh, person come through and take the same figure and put pluses. And I have a feeling DNA might disappear from many of them. But uh, in any case, I'm going to argue that uh, DNA gets quite a few pluses. And uh, if you're interested in tracking biodiversity classes and the variables that compose them. So let's think about a little bit what is happening and changing in the DNA business. Now, to 2015, we had this technology called Sanger sequencing, which was mature, very expensive to utilize, generated relatively few sequences, and about that time, massively paralyzed sequencing came on the table, and one of the very cool things about these instruments is they read individual DNA molecules. You're no longer, Sanger read a whole collection of molecules at once and integrated the signal. Next generation sequencing technology is reading individual molecules and it's reading them in large numbers. So that's the new sequencing technology that's been brought to bear and is enabling global scale biosurveillance. Now the new method uh, is not so new as Adriana indicated. It was first, we proposed it in 2003, so it's 20 years old. I guess that's an old, some of you probably weren't born. Uh, how can it be a new idea? Uh, in any case, um, it's the idea that we can take a short sequence of DNA. Genomes are big. Our genome is seven billion base pairs. You can take a tiny piece of the genome and a tiny piece of DNA is enough to distinguish effectively all of the species on the planet. Of course, that's a big oversimplification. But think about that, the power of that approach. So in the case of the animal kingdom, we selected this gene Mitochondrial CO1, cytochrome oxidase 1, it's in every organism that uses oxidative phosphorylation, so it's a widely distributed gene. And the average animal genome is 600 million base pairs. If you read that target region, 650 base pairs, a millionth of the genome, you can discriminate the species on our planet. So that's very, that sets you up for a very cost-effective solution. And this is a hard to pronounce word. I want to, it looks even harder to pronounce than a Welsh word. So I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but that is the DNA barcode for this species of tachinid fly. And you can see the legs away. That specimen resides in the Smithsonian. It gave up one of its legs for science and uh, that donated the, uh, the sequence for that individual. Now, before you... Um, maybe get an impression that all we're interested in is little slices of DNA. I want to make it absolutely clear that that's not our approach. Uh, in this particular photograph, you can see those rather neatly organized specimens. They're sitting in a 96 well plate. That's the sort of standard fodder that you feed into the DNA sequencers for DNA extraction first, then PCR and sequencing. But every one of those specimens in our workflow is photographed high resolution, Z-axis stacked. Those images are 18 megabases each. 
From those images, we can do, bring artificial intelligence to bear. We can determine the size of the organisms. We can assign rough taxonomy at this point in time. Every specimen comes with GPS coordinates. And, um, of course, the time of collection, which allows us to look at phenology. And it works. I could show you a few thousand pages. Someone asked me just a little while ago, does barcoding actually work? Well, I'll show you this figure, but if you'd like to see more, we have 961,000 species that look pretty much the same. Let's not spend our time on that. Eibel, launched in 2010 in Toronto. By 2010, we felt this approach is promising, but the world's a big place. We need to develop an alliance. That's the CN Tower. It was pretty cool we managed to run the DNA barcode of Castor canadensis, the beaver, up the CN Tower. So it sounded like a good idea. It was all misty that night, and it looked absolutely spectacular. Christian Burks, uh, Genome Ontario's lead in Nagoya, with the executive secretary of the CBD at that point in time, officially launching IBOL as a collaborative program of the CBD. Here we are today. 40 nations are involved in uh, the International Barcode of Life Consortium. There's some gaps, as you can see. Any of you live in one of the countries that's white, please think about uh, getting in touch and thinking about contributing your scientific community's talents to it. And our goal is to provide, this is a big overstatement, provide humanity with the knowledge to manage biodiversity. We're not going to be doing it alone. We absolutely recognize that. But in some rooms, it plays well if you say, overstate what you can do. IBO was launched in 2010. We have a 35 year research program. We're planning three research projects. The first one was five years in duration. The second one we're in the midst of 10 year duration. And in 2030, we will start our biggest project, PBM, Planetary Biodiversity Mission. So the first project was barcode 500K. Let me talk to you a little bit about it. It met its goals on time and budget. The one thing that we are absolutely is action oriented budget conscious and time conscious. You don't win support if you make promises and don't fulfill them. Barcode 500K said it would deliver barcode records for 500,000 species and this is how they were sprinkled across the planet by 2015. <clears throat> we didn't just deliver them, we developed a core facility to generate that data. That data didn't just fall from the skies. And we met, the goal was to get to the point that we could generate a million barcode, process a million specimens through our core facility in a year, and we actually met that. And I'll tell you, it required a bit of effort back in 2015 to do that. We developed the informatics, plat the informatics platforms um, to handle that data, to, to validate it, to protect it, to make it available to the world, the barcode of life data system. And, uh, the most important achievement really was, I think, uh, aside from collecting that data, was in exploring the data, we were able to develop an algorithmic approach, an AI approach, if you like, that allows you to recognize species boundaries, uh, the so-called barcode index number system. If 95% of the species on our planet are not described, how can we possibly survey life on the planet? Well, we can't unless we find some way of recognizing species proxies. And that's basically what the BIN system does, delivers a species proxy. And there are now 966,000 of these BINs on eyeball, on, on the barcode of life data system. Every one of them has a DOI. Everyone gathers up the images of the specimens, looks at the genetic distance to the nearest neighbor, looks at the variation within a species, and this is basically, arguably, sort of an automated species page. 2015, we had a meeting in Canada and we were like really happy. We met our target. Okay, let's go. We looked at the budget projections to do Bioscan, the next project, and it was in the billions of dollars it had been tough to raise 120 million. 
Um, I said, look, no, we've got to stop and spend however long it takes to develop new protocols that can collapse those costs. It took about three years. 2019, Tron time, this is the group of people that met there. Uh, the eyeball community met at its every second year meeting, and we decided we're ready to go on Bioscan. We had no money, uh, and we needed 180 million, but we knew if we could raise that money, we'd get the job done. What was the job? We want to advance species discovery. We wanted to extend the barcode reference library by 10 million specimens. We wanted to move into a new area of investigation species interactions. And we wanted to start the job of building biodiversity baselines around the planet, 100,000 bulk samples. Our analytical sequencing protocols were mature, the barcode workflow, the metabarcode workflow where you take a whole bulk of samples, of specimens, thousands of specimens, extract DNA from the bulk, ascertain the species in that collection by matching it back to the DNA barcode reference library, and then of course eDNA and it from water or air, and then banging it against the reference library to see what species are represented. The costs are collapsing. To generate a DNA barcode record today is about $1. And it's about $1 because of PAC Biomachines, SQL2. Metabarcoding and eDNA studies are run on short read platforms, and the cost for them is about $50 a sample to read the species composition of 1,000 or more specimens in that bulk sample. It's just pretty amazing, but you need somewhere to store that data, and this is where Bioscan's informatics platforms come in. Bold is there since 2005. It's the repository, but these big data streams required a new platform, Embrave, and it deals with the big flood of sequences, hundreds of millions of reads coming off a single analytical run on these high throughput sequencers and you need another platform to massage that data. And this is what's happened to barcode production in our core facility. 2008, we're running a couple hundred thousand samples. We got to a million in 2015, and then we laid off and tried to develop new protocols. And just as we were beginning to ramp up in 2020, uh, that damn virus decided it would come and uh, make our life complicated. And it, we didn't shut down, but we were severely restricted, number of people on site. But last year we hit two million, this year we hit three million. And I've got to say, the sky's the limit. And the sky's the limit because of something that happened this year. Oxford Nanopore Technology has been around since 2012. It has a beautiful concept of a sequencer the size of your thumb that cost $1,000 versus $800,000 for a pack bio. The problem was the sequences that it generated just weren't very great. They developed a new flow cell, 10.R, 10.4, this year, and oh my God, sequencing performance has just hugely improved. We're such fanboys and fangirls for, um, for nanopore sequencing right now. It's gonna change everything. Take the $100,000 that it would have required to buy one sequel. I'm going to buy 800 minutes. I'm going to buy 800 flow cells. In three days, I can process 80 million specimens. Would you like us to complete the inventory of all animal life on the planet? Give me the specimens. Next month, we'll have it done. This is staggering. The cost to sequence on, on a minion is one cent per specimen. One cent. This is our world <clears throat> a little while from now. So, a little bit of background. Our living planet, a library of life. Every species like a book, holding the information for humanity's greatest innovations. 
new medicines, technologies, and economic development. But we are burning those books before we've even read them. We want to know all life, every species. We are the International Barcode of Life Consortium, and we are illuminating biodiversity through DNA-based analysis. By using automation and rapidly evolving DNA sequencing technology, we are bringing this vision to life. Our new scientific program, Bioscan, is shedding light on unknown species, tracking their distribution, abundance, and interactions. Bioscan will bring us closer to building a complete library of life, forming the basis for an Earth observation system. Together, we must act. We are not just scientists. We are rangers in national parks collecting the data required to monitor ecosystems. We are indigenous peoples, protecting our lands and traditions for future generations. We are citizens supporting science and conservation in our country. This is Bioscan, collecting, mapping, and revealing life's diversity. Our species acting to protect all species before we lose the possibility of even knowing them. So that was a pitch piece for, for uh, Bioscan in 2019, and now I want to just take a few minutes. I can see I'm running up against the clock, but okay. Um, so what are we trying to do on the species uh, discovery front? We're taking two approaches. We said we would barcode five million specimens, so we're taking two approaches. The first is that we're skimming. We're going to 500 sites around the planet and running 10,000 specimens from each of those sites to ascertain how many species we encounter. And here's where we are today. Uh, 275,000 species registered, 3.25 million, so we're on target to exceed, we're halfway through uh, Bioscan right now, so uh, we're, we're above uh, expectations right now. We have three areas in which we're trying to do what we call deep dives, and one of the organ places is Canada, the other is Europe, and the other is little Costa Rica, which happens to be thought to be home to about a million multicellular species as perhaps a hundred and some thousand here in Canada. So we said, okay, we're gonna do five million uh, barcode records from each of these three regions. And, um, you know, Costa Rica got behind it. They signed an executive degree in June of 2019. They wanted to barcode all of the species in their nation to help understand and manage biodiversity. This is Costa Rica today. We've analyzed 3.4 million, there's no question. We're gonna burn the entire 5 million just on Costa Rica and have a long way to go. Um, but we're not ignoring the rest of the world, but this is where we are with Costa Rica. We're 129,000 species in with 3.4, and we're pushing that number up at 1 million per year, and this is with a single sampling method. Look what's happening to species discovery. Uh, since Linnaean taxonomy was uh, initiated, about 7,500 species per year were described, and you can see the elevated rate of species discovery or bin discovery with barcoding. We're at 150,000 species per year currently, and I guarantee you that number is going to surge. And look, uh, the Linnaean intersection. That's something that I've been looking forward to for a little while. Um, in 2028, if not before, there will be more species registered with DNA sequences, multicellular organisms, in 25 years than the Linnaean Enterprise has registered in 275. I'm not castigating Linnaean taxonomy. I absolutely believe in the power of taxonomy and the importance of every person that devotes their life to the study of organisms intensely. I admire them immensely but it's not the way we can manage inventory on this planet. And guess what? When we finish that inventory of species, that's not exactly the job. That's like species are the fundamental particles of biological systems, just like elements. The periodic chart summarizes the elements that make up our planet, but guess what? You need to understand how things interact, and that's absolutely, Ecosystems are bioreactors. 
we need to understand how all those fundamental particles are interacting. And guess what? DNA can make that possible in ways that were just so opaque before. Take a caterpillar, extract DNA from that caterpillar, whack it with a set of different PCR primers, amplify it up, sequence it, and from that one caterpillar, you may get the parasitoid that's living in its body. You can get the nematode parasite. You can get its food plant. You can get the fungi in its gut. You can get the bacteria that are in its gut or on its body. These are symbiomes. And of course, you don't just do one caterpillar of a particular species. You do one after another, and you build up the connections to that species, and then you get a, a figure like on the your right side, um, showing that species with its connections of life. And of course, that's, that is a species symbiome, but we're really interested in the community symbiome, so we do this for every species. Now, this is a really interesting challenge. So, I mean, you can take a larval organism, a larval insect, and when you run that insect, you start pulling out all of these parasitoids that no one can identify, but they get a bin and they came from an organism, the connections of life. I'm getting really interested in nematodes recently just because they're thought to be immensely diverse. And so we dug into, there are 25,000 described species of nematodes that thought there may be somewhere between one and 10 million. There could be 50 million. That little fly there, see all those little white lines in it? Those are nematodes. Those are parasitic nematodes in its body never would have been detected except for the fact that when we analyzed that fly, it gave its fly sequence and the nematode sequences that were within it. And among the 20,000 insects with nematodes that we've looked at so far, we found 5,000 different species of nematodes, highly specialized. There could be 10 million species of nematodes that just live on insects. This is the kind of work that's just beginning. You can take different genes, Take ITS2 and you can read the fungi. Take this particular bumblebee species, Bombus vegans, from British Columbia. You can read the flowers it's visiting and you can read the yeast that it's associated with. This is where interaction biology is headed. Just staggeringly complex. This is going to require a, a serious uh, attack with AI to interpret these. But to contextualize these interactions, we need to understand species distributions. We think we, I love these maps. Humans love organized, painted, painting the world. This world sample painted with ecoregions. There are 844 of them. We decided we're going to go out and test the objectivity of ecoregions by using standard sampling method insects, the most diverse group on our planet, on land. Set up a standard sampling method, malaise traps, take these bulk samples and read the species in them and ask how similar are they among sites within an ecoregion and how divergent are they between ecoregions? Are all ecoregions made equal? Um, these are the sampling sites that we have worked on so far. This is what the world looks like in terms, we've sampled 171 ecoregions so far. Please, if you live in an area that's white or you have connections in an area that is white, put up a laze trap and help us to get coverage for the ecoregions of the planet. Here's Canada, we're a bit aggressive in our home country. We've got 15 ecoregions in Canada. And this is the most southerly ecoregion, the mixed wood plains, the sites that we have sampled within it. And 25,000 species showed up in that sampling and here are chord diagrams that show you the interconnection between those sites. We're now at a time when we can survey an annual species composition on a regular basis at low price and ask how similar things are and how things change through time. If you look at the boreal shield, move out of that one ecoregion, the orange one, to the boreal shield, you can see something interesting. They may be painted different colors, but 40% of the species that they are shared. These are gray ecoregions. If you like black and white, go to Costa Rica. Seven ecoregions, and I'm gonna dive into one tiny area up in the Northwest. <clears throat> Dry forest, rainforest, cloud forest. Look at the lack of overlap in species composition. 
one to four percent overlap. Those are ecoregions. One of the cool things that we can now do with this data is you can just press a button and answer questions like, what's the amount of species sharing? 1% between Canada and Costa Rica, 18% between Ca Costa Rica and Argentina. This is the kind of information we need to manage biodiversity on the planet. So I'm arguing then that we're beginning to see hints that these beautifully colored patterns don't really represent or need augmented information as we begin to think about 30 by 30 and setting aside lambs for preservation. So where are we in Bioscan? <clears throat> Bioscan will exceed its species discovery goal by threefold. It will double its species interaction work, and we're going to have to push hard to hit the half of the ecoregions. But we're going to meet our targets. What's coming next? Planetary Biodiversity Mission, a 15-year project, a, roughly a billion dollars, 800 million, maybe easier to sell than a billion. Um, 15 years. Can we afford it? You know, it's a no-brainer. Of course we can afford it. Humanity spends billions of dollars every year to advance understanding of our world. Here are the big projects, mega science projects, astronomy, physics, space. Know how to do it. Biology? No. Definitely not biodiversity science. We need to become a mega science discipline. It's the only way we're going to have the coordination, the longevity. We can't do it with research grants. This demands a whole different funding model. Two missions. I love the fact that humanity found 600 million for a flyby of Pluto. I love the fact that humanity is spending a billion dollars to decommission the International Space Center. We're looking for, for 800 million to protect life on our planet. So, last slide. It's a shared biodiversity mission. It's a mission that's going to require remote sensing, bioacoustics and imaging, DNA. Within about 15 years, we'll know all the species on our planet we'll be exposing the web of life in detail. We really do need to understand those interactions. <clears throat> and I think very relevant to Geobon, Andy, we need that global biomonitoring capacity. I'm so grateful for the funders that have supported our work over the past 20 years. It's um, only thing that's made it possible and the tremendous group of people that work with me at the Center for Biodiversity Genomics and the many, many colleagues involved in the International Biodiversity of Life program. So let me just finish and be happy to answer any questions with a little dreamlike video. You can interpret what all the dots are. Thanks. Um, it's really an amazing accomplishment, and um, I, I don't really know exactly how you're organized, so my, my question is meant to be completely neutral, but <laughs> I'm wondering about centralized versus distributed model for doing this, and, and wondering whether, given how affordable sequencing has become, it really seems like the, finding the voucher specimens is the pinch point, and obviously you want a global repository for all the information, but I'm wondering how you're thinking about whether you could ramp up by going to a more distributed model. And maybe a related question, I'm wondering about populations and subspecies detection. Sorry, the populations, of, I didn't hear the last. Um, the ability uh, for barcoding currently to detect um, population level information, subspecies and things like that. 
Yeah, I mean, those are both really good questions. And I mean, my answer last year would have been pretty different from the one this year. Um, core facilities brought with it this, uh, you know, there, when you're doing thing, it, it looks like a really simple workflow, but if you're doing a lot of making, it takes a while to become really good at doing it. And the capital investments to, for example, grab an automated high resolution image of every specimen. We tried the highly distributed stuff where people take pictures in their home labs, send the specimens in, and we just do sequencing. And most of the specimens images that come in are garbage. You really need to generate high quality results. You've got to have high control over the processes and infrastructure that are in place. Um, until recently, the high, and you know the sequencing costs were so high. If you didn't go to one of these big machines. And these big machines have service contracts of $100,000 each per year. So if you're not using them intensively, no one can afford them. So there are very few core facilities. 2019, when we proposed Bioscan and began to think about PBM, we were thinking about core facilities on each continent. Oxford Nanoport Technologies changes that completely. I can now absolutely see how we can have distributed uh, at least the sequencing and we're working towards distributed high quality imaging. And so then the question is, what are the core facilities there for? The core facilities are the enablers for the distributed effort because, you know, we just did a little run where we put, mixed up a pool of amplicons from 100,000 specimens, sequenced it, got beautiful recovery. The problem is to do that, you've got to do some rather sophisticated molecular things in setting up these plates and getting it organized. You can't do it artisanally. You need liquid handling robots. You're going to make mistakes otherwise. But what we plan to do at the core facilities is freeze dry PCR plates, manufacture, send this out to the distributed nodes, let people collect, let people PCR, let people sequence, sequence results. You can misinterpret next generation sequence data with incredible ease. We need to make sure that the data that's flowing is analyzed through very regimented pathways to ensure data quality. So I don't know if that's really answering your question or not. We're still thinking about how to do this well, but things are changing. You asked about subspecies, and right now we're fighting the big battle trying to register the 50 million species so that we even know the major compartments of life. Five years ago, seven years ago, the most species-rich group of insects on the planet were beetles, most species-rich order. It's now known that that conclusion that was held for nearly a century is wrong. Hymenopterans are more diverse. Dipterans are more diverse. So we're dealing with that higher level question how many species are there? And you can dive down with barcodes and look at regional patterning. There's an invasive moth in Europe. Came from Australia. We'd barcoded populations in Australia. They fell into four lineages. We now know that the Euro lineage, the Euro invader, came from West Australia. So barcodes do have subspecies signal. We're just not focused on it. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciated how you opened the talk with an overview of the powerful tools that are being leveraged for biodiversity monitoring and assessment. I found the slide with the pluses and minuses to be a little dangerous. We are already doing work to assess genetic diversity using remote sensing. There are already projects that are combining metabarcoding and remote sensing don't you think it's more powerful to find ways to leverage these tools together and in combination rather than claiming that each needs to have its own domain? Thank you. Yeah, I don't think I did a very, <clears throat> if I, I don't think I did a very good job of making, you know, that point. I'm all for collaboration. I'm even more for collaboration having learned a bit more about what the remote sensing community is doing. But 
trying to take a look at levels of sequence heterogeneity from space in individual species, that's pushing it for me. Um, I don't think a lot of the genetic metrics are going to be sky sensible, sky sensed. My position, please, prove me wrong. I would love to see, I mean, we can't, at this point, imagine walking through a forest and determining the identity of an organism without touching it and extracting DNA from it, unless it's floating through the air. Individual molecules in the sky, that would be pretty cool. But I heard about 30 meter pixel resolution. That means you can see a blue whale, if you're lucky, on a good day. I'm pretty uneducated in terms of remote sensing. Going to admit that, and I'll look forward to getting educated. We should talk. Thanks. Th OK, thank you. We will probably take one more question, or well, two more quick questions, and then we will need to move on. Uh, thank you. This is a really great work. Um, I'm just curious, uh, because we have all this data, it's huge, it's impressive, it tells us a lot about uh, biodiversity and the number of species on planet, and eventually if you would take the case of insects like the bumblebee you show, so you discovered more nematodes, fungi, bacteria, viruses through these methods. Uh, actually, all of this, it's still it's based on a portion of the DNA and not the entire DNA, so we don't know much about it. And the second thing, it's about the dead. So all of these are dead. Uh, we know that there are fungi there, but we don't know about the actual interactions. So we have put in, we are putting a lot of effort into these technologies to understand in better biodiversity, but we less, uh, what we don't understand is the actual life, how these organisms interact in the real, Life. So how could this, uh, what this effort you are leading can help us to understand better the real interactions in the forest, <coughs> the fungi, the viruses, the bacteria, the insects, etc.? An, an ambitious young man. Um, it's, it's a big challenge ahead. I mean, that's what's so exciting. When you can, I mean, the very first task, if you're interested in looking at entire genomes, is to be able to understand what the genome compartments are, right? What we're, what we're setting up and, and why the um, Biodiversity Genomics Europe is working so collaboratively between the barcode community and the genome community is the genome community needs a feeder pipeline to give it the things that are going to be sequenced. And so uh, my goal certainly is to be a great enabler of genome science. I would love a genome for every species. In fact, I think that's one of the big missions for humanity. The little video talking about burning the books of life without reading the genomes. The barcode is not enough. It's the title. We need to read the genome. It's becoming cheaper and easier. It will get done. Your other question is a really interesting one about what can we do to look at interactions in vivo, and it's probably getting away from DNA. It's probably looking at the live DNA, i.e. messenger RNA, looking at transcriptomics, metatranscriptomics in the field. That's how we start to get closer. But you know, we know so little about these interactions today. When you consider all of the nematodes on our planet, there are 5,000 different species with sequences, nematode sequences. In one month, we discovered more species in insects than it's in all, the entire nematode registry. It's way, way early. We need thousands of people working on species interactions. And it's going to deliver blinding insights. This is like we're just delivering, uh, encountering chemical reactions for the first time. It's pretty exciting. Okay, there was a last question there in the back. Gentleman with the microphone.
I work for Pars Canada and sorry. Um, I understand the genomic tools is super helpful. It has potential compared to other tools like remote sensing, drone. However, being a practitioner perspective, the genome tools is not getting popular to the practitioner to have the tools application into day-to-day -day conservation management. For example, we supported the Malaysia trap. The communication is the big challenge among the practitioner that how they can apply this information into the manage adaptive management process. Do you have any thought about this? Thank you. Yes, well, I mean, I think there's nothing more that we would like to see than the science that we're doing contributing to better protection and understanding of the life in our national park system here in Canada. Parks Canada was one of our early supporters, allowed us to go into all the national parks and carry out baseline surveys. At that time, it was pretty tough to do, pretty expensive. I think in terms of managing our parks, it would be awful useful if we had just an ongoing monitoring program that could now be delivered very cheaply in our 49 parks or 50. That, I think, is one of the responsibilities of Parks Canada to understand what's living in the national, natural areas that is protecting and what's happening to them through time. Because I can tell you that a lot of the species that meant a lot to me when I was a child are no longer here and their loss is not well documented. Parks Canada set up monitoring programs in our national parks and serve as a model for the world because I think we need this in every national park around the planet. We're willing to, we'd love to help. That may not be a good answer to your question. Let's talk at coffee. And, uh, cause I'm sure people would like that. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, for this great talk.